Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining me this uh, session. As Ami just shared, um, this session will be about the key strategies for 2024 around uh, ML ops, ML engineering, and um, ML in total. So um, your expectation from this session is to learn more about the new technologies, how you can adopt them, and what we've seen, I personally seen with our customers um, actually running machine learning in production. Um, as Ami shared, feel free to use the Q&A to ask questions or raise your hand and ask your question. We want this session to be as interactive as possible. So uh, uh, please, if you have any questions, feel free to do that. In addition, you'll see the uh, link in the chat. So if you want to have a deeper session about one of the things that we're talking in here, uh, you can just schedule a session directly from this link. So a bit about the content for today's uh, session. So first of all, as you probably uh, understand, we will talk a bit about Gen AI, not just about it, but we'll talk about Gen AI and how I've seen Gen AI actually being part of production systems. We'll talk about open source, commercial solutions, when you should choose one of each and uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages of each one of them. Uh, some of the complex model architecture that we are seeing more and more nowadays, um, and eventually how you can monitor your models, especially uh, uh, talking about Gen AI and how it changes the way you actually manage your models, monitor them, and understand the value of your uh, machine learning models. So um, let's start with a bit like introduction about Gen AI versus traditional or why I do believe that there are some differences between Gen AI, LLMs, or you know, any type of generative models versus what I'll call traditional models. Um, so first of all, why there is a difference? Why does it matter if it's a traditional or a Gen AI model? Um, the way those models works and the data that is used to actually build those models is quite different. For example, from unstructured data, let's say text images, to structured data, um, of course, you need to create this data in a different way. In many cases, Gen AI models is based on really complicated pipelines. Um, so for example, if I'm talking about LLMs, you need to understand how to write the right prompt. You need to understand where is your data coming from, your private data. How do you manage the history of a conversation? And even things like, should they use a one general purpose model or divide to multiple models per use case? So many different architecture that are based on the actual problem that you want to solve uh, versus traditional models that are usually really specific for a specific challenge. And the last regarding uh, why does it matter is the cost. So, um, Generative models, of course, need quite a lot of compute power. It eventually uh, um, changed the way the model reacts, the latency that you can expect from such models, of course, the cost of such models, um, and eventually, you know, even do you, can you use a tree training model or you need to train your own model? Training a Gen AI model from scratch is something that costs quite a lot versus uh, um, traditional models or versus just using a pre-trained model. So there are a lot of questions that you need to answer uh, uh, and decide what is the specific problem and what is your specific solution. Um, there are some differences in model optimization techniques as well. So for example, uh, with traditional models, usually you train models from scratch or fine tune a pre-trained model. Um, but with, again, with generative models, it changes, right? You can train a model, you can fine tune a model, but there are other techniques like allergies, retrieval, augmented generation that can you can actually use your own private data to give the right context to a model. Um, another regarding model optimization techniques is how do you, as I said before, choose the right model for your use case? Do you really need a general purpose model or you can just use um, a smaller model that is actually trained for your specific use case. Um, can I maybe acceler accelerate my, my model? And same for model monitoring. Traditional models that are well-defined, 
metrics like accuracy, precision, F1 score, eventually you can know you have the right tools to measure if your model act as you want it to act. If it's a binary classification model, for example, um, you can you predict something and eventually something happens, right? If you connect it to, you have the right accuracy metric, for example. Uh, where with GNI models, it's a bit more subjective. Um, so let's say it's an LLM model. How do I know if the output is actually right? How do I know that the language it used was uh, right for the specific customer? How do I know if the user actually engage with this LLM model and get the right output of, out of it? So in many cases, uh, there are still not good metrics for GNI models. It really depends on the use case, on the business. And assessing a model is quite complicated. What I've seen many companies do is use a human in the loop or use a business metric to understand if the model actually act as they expect it to act. So that's something, of course, that you need to understand you need to measure accordingly and you need to build your whole architecture to make sure that it's actually something that you can measure and not just another model that's running somewhere and you're not sure that you're actually getting the 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 right output the right outcome from that model <clears throat> and last before i'm going to the key strategies is is another question that i've seen many companies ask and many companies try to iterate on is open source versus commercial models. So first of all, in traditional use cases, both deep learning use cases, um, linear regression, uh, uh, force-based, boosting-based uh, use cases, open source is, is basically the standard, right? So for example, models like uh, XGBoost, CADBoost, linear regression that actually exist for years now. Computer vision, there are models like YOLO, OpenCV, RCNN, many others. Same for language models, BERT, Transformers, LSTM. Eventually, all those different models are open source models that can be used for any type of challenge. You don't really need, uh, um, it's it's not a general purpose model, right? Um, let's say I have, um, um, let's say, a computer vision use case. I want to classify images. So eventually, I can just take one of those um, open source models and make sure that I use that for my use case, just train that, and usually it will, won't cost too much. With Gen AI, it's a bit different. Most of the leading Gen AI models, and, and by saying leading, basically based on public leaderboards that in many cases doesn't really reflect your own business use case, but most of those leading Gen AI models are still commercial products. So for example, LLMs, OpenAI models, Google models, AI21, Anthropic, uh, Queer, and of course, many others. Computer vision use cases. So from OpenAI, Google, and, and Nijerni, of course. And again, many other solutions that are out there. Um, and, and the reason why commercial products, at least as I see it, are still leading this is that eventually to train those models, you need massive data requirements. You need to actually build the data in the right way to train a generative model. The cost of training a foundation model is, is really high. Um, so you actually need to have the initial funds to, to, cost, to, to train this model and make sure that this training eventually will actually give you the impact that you want. And the architectural complexity. So eventually to get the right model, you need to build the right architecture that can give you the right outcome that you expect. Um, but although I said that still the leading Gen AI models are commercial products, we are seeing quite a lot of uh, open source models that are getting better and better. So for computer vision use cases like Stable Diffusion to um, LLM use cases like LAM2 and, and Falcon, that actually in many use cases can get to really, really good results with a really cost-effective uh, uh, solution that because those models are usually a bit tinier than the uh, uh, commercial products, you can actually even fine tune um, or train on your own data. Um, so although currently we are seeing quite a lot of companies actually calling commercial products and 
connecting dots as part of their architecture. Um, I do see open source as something that is growing and growing and more companies actually using open source as well. I will add, again, as a last uh, um, bullet point in here is that there are some license challenges in open source and commercial solutions. Uh, so of course, if you want to use a generative model as part of your product, make sure that you understand the license. Uh, for example, um, I, I asked uh, ChatGPT if I can use its output to train my models. And based on the license of ChatGPT, for example, um, you cannot. So this is one example of you know one part of the license of a commercial model that eventually can change the way I interact with with models. <clears throat> so um, before I'm going to key strategies, some examples, even a demo of how I can build such solutions. Um, again, I'm just reminding that if you have any questions. Go ahead, you can ask your questions in the QA section. Uh, you can ask your questions in the chat. And of course, as we said before, you can use the link that is in the chat to schedule a meeting as well. So if you want any like further discussion about one of those topics, feel free to schedule this uh, meeting as well. And uh, we'd love to discuss that. So, um. Going now to key strategies for 2024, and uh, basically the first question uh, that we are getting ask, asked is, how do I choose my model? What should be my first uh, project? Uh, we are seeing quite a lot of companies that decided that they want to invest in AI. They are seeing the impact of generative models. They are seeing the impact of recommendation systems. They are seeing the impact of even marketing models like Journal LTV, um, and they want to know how to start doing that. Um, and you know, the first question that you need to ask yourself, or the first set of questions, is: Is it a specific domain? Can I use a general purpose model, or I need to actually have my own specific model? And of course, there are implications to that, uh, like cost, like the performance of a model, the experience of the, the service or the person that interacts with the model, and how do I measure the impact of my model? Um, I can give you examples specifically for that is that in many cases, companies you know look at solutions like ChatGPT, for example, or BARD, or one of those general purpose models, and think that this is something they can use in their system. Um, but there are some disadvantages for general purpose models. For example, they are trained on quite a lot of data that in some cases you don't want to be part of an answer for your platform, right? You don't want people to ask your platform things like, I don't know, what's the weather somewhere or uh, um, anything that is not related to a product. Another is that you, you don't really know what data this model was trained on, so you can't really be sure what will be the answer on which data set it uses actually to answer that? Um, I actually see, uh, I've seen yesterday a nice, um, a nice photo of someone um, just getting service from a chatbot based on one of the general purpose models and the service wasn't good. So he asked the chatbot to write a song about how bad the service is, the customer service. Um, and the chatbot actually wrote that. So, so that's one example of something that you probably don't want, you know, um, a solution in your product to do. So again, you can you can fine tune that, you can make sure that your prompts actually protect you against that, but you need to think about general purpose versus specific domain, the cost of each one of the solutions, and what should be your choice. Um, second is your data, because again, you want to build a model not as a general purpose chat for like anything, but probably for something for your product. So you need to ask yourself, uh, what is my internal data? How can I use it? Should I train based on this data? Can I really train? Can I create the right structure, the question and answers uh, structure to train a Gen AI model, or should it be just traditional model or you know, how we've done it till two years ago, something like that. Um, Maybe can I use an RAG to do that? So I, I shared a bit about it before, but um, there is a nice architecture 
in this uh, uh, diagram that I'm going to demo as well, um, that basically use REG. So what is REG? It's the ability to use my internal data to change the context of a general purpose model. So you can see in this, for example, uh, um, uh, diagram is I query a model. The query eventually uh, um, gets embedded into a vector and I can use a vector database to get back similar queries or similar objects in my internal data source that I can use to actually enrich my prompt, enrich the context of my prompt, and based on that, I eventually get better results for my model. So this is REGs. Um, it's actually nowadays becoming quite, quite a standard for LLMs. Um, and it allows you to do things like you know, uh, create vector from your documentation, for example. This is something that I'm going to show you as well. So let's say I create, uh, um, um, I upload all my documentation to a vector database, and then I can query my model with the context of, based on the Quark documentation, can you answer this question? And it will use this vector space documentation to actually answer. Um, so this is one example. And this is one way to use your internal data in addition, of course, to training models based on your data. And, and that, of course, is actually creating quite a complex architecture. So now it's not just a model. Um, you can use, by the way, commercial models like ChatGPT, for example, um, or commercial models like any one of the others um, for the actual generation. And you can even use commercial models for the embedding models. So for example, the um, OpenAI embedding model, um, ADA, can be used to create the vector space. But this architecture is more complicated than that. And you need to make sure that you know how to build it, connect all those things together and A-B test not just on the model or the embedding layer, but maybe all on the prompt template that you use as well. Maybe if I'll change something in the, in the prompt, it will change my prediction um, and, and give me better results. So those are different things that you need to make sure that you can actually change in your architecture. You need to make sure that you can A-B test on that, test that, and eventually get to the best model that you can. Um, another question or another uh, uh, discussion that is connected to that is, should I have only one model? So again, with um, traditional models, traditional machine learning, usually we'll have a model per use case. So usually for a, for a recommendation model, a recommendation system, sorry, I'll have a bunch of models for that. And then I have a model for my um, LTV, lifetime value of customers uh, use case. And maybe I'll have a model for, I don't know, um, credit risk or something like that. So each one of my use cases have its own separate model or maybe models. Um, and I must say that the case is, is actually similar with general purpose or LLMs or any type of generative models as well, because this architecture that you can see in the side, sorry, um, let's say that my platform is, for example, uh, supported in few different languages, then my LLM model and my prompt will probably change based on the language as well. So I will probably have another model or API that will take the query, decide on its language, and then you know the architecture will split based on the language. Another example is the architecture will split based on the specific use case, specific scenario that the customer is asking about. So model per use case is still something that is relevant. And as I said, those are things that you need to test and make sure that you can actually get to the best model performance that you can based on different iteration and different building blocks that you change in your architecture. Um, and, and that's actually connected to model evaluation. We talked about it a bit in the um, intro part of this uh, uh, webinar, but how can I make sure that my model impacts my business? Eventually, that's the question that you need to ask, even before you develop something, even before I create my, my, my model, my architecture, actually, I need to understand if I can actually measure that. 
um, we, we built a nice use case with one of our customers that we actually, um, basically they created a chatbot to help with um, their customer service. So they already have customer service. They are answering customers' requests and they wanted to make sure that they optimize that. Um, so actually they added an LLM solution based, by the way, in OpenAI on the, um, other embedding on a vector store. And by the way, many different type of, of collections. So basically vector spaces for different use cases. Um, and the nice way that they actually add the way to measure it because they already have the solution. They just changed the technology behind it so they can actually measure the satisfaction rate. They can measure the um, click rate on the recommended uh, answer. And they build from, from the first day, they build the, um, they build the solution with the right metrics that they can use to check if their models actually give them the right impact and to iterate on that, change some of the templates, change the model that they use behind the scenes and make sure that they always optimize their metrics. And in some cases, even create multiple models, multiple architecture per, for example, geography, because maybe one model is better in the US than in the EU and you can use any different one in the EU. Um, so this is one example that is really interesting to me because I think that creating the right metric is really challenging. Um, human in the loop, by the way, is something that's pretty much a must for uh, generative use cases. Um, of course, again, as I said before, for um, classical traditional use cases, in many cases, you don't need that. Um, but if you have that as part of your use case, think about ways to actually utilize that and create the metrics uh, based on this human that is already out there. Um, close the feedback loop. That's, of course, another part of any type of metric. Make sure that you connect your predictions to your satisfaction, to what the user actually do afterwards. And based on that, you can try and create the right metrics. So those are things that um, you can connect to each other and make sure that you actually build your solution based on that. So um, asking again, um, if anyone have any questions on the things that I've showed and shared and talked about till now, um, feel free to raise your hand or ask your questions in the Q&A section in this uh, Zoom chat. So um, moving on to a really quick demo, just to show how those things actually impact is I created exactly this demo. So I have a model. This model, by the way, specifically is built on based on an open source, um, Llama 2 by Facebook. So this is basically the LLM part. Um, for embedding, it uses an eigenface model. Don't remember specifically which one, but basically what I've done is I uh, collected all our documentations, pre-processed it a bit, and then I used an embedding model to save all the, the, the documentations to a vector database. So now when I ask a question to this uh, model, to this chatbot, I can actually use the vector database to enrich my query in context and based on that get a more specific results out of this model. So let me reshare the screen um, to show you um, this example. Sorry for that, so just a second. Okay, so I'll share the screen, sorry. If you have, again, um, any questions, feel free to ask them. And after I show this demo, I see there are some questions. So after I share the demo, I will um, answer the questions. 
Great. So um, can you see the screen? Um, yeah, I see in here that uh, you do. So I created this rug example. Basically, it's just a Streamlit application currently running locally, but that application uh, uses a rug model. So basically, it uses, again, the same architecture I shared with you, um, the Llama 2, the embedding model, and a rug. So for now, I, I decided to not use the vector store. This is the question that I asked this model. Uh, how do I build the model in Quark? And you can see that basically the answer is that Quark is a fictional platform. Llama 2 is not familiar with Quark. Um, it doesn't exist in reality. So, so actually it's a really nice answer that I got back that the model is not familiar with Quark. And once I add the vector store to that question as well, so if I go back to the presentation, um, let me just show that. So what's now happening is that now I'll add the vector store as part of this architecture. So it will use the vector store um, context to actually answer the question. And what you'll see is that now, and let me go back to the application, uh, what you should see in a second is that basically the question will still look the same, but it will add the, um, the output from the rug model into the question. It will use that to change the context a bit and then it will use this um, this context to actually enrich my answer. So again, same question. Now use the Vexel store. Uh, you can see that now it knows about the Quark documentation. It can actually answer um, what is Quark. It can answer um, again how to do that in the SDK. And of course, I can use this to. Um, and this is not optimized at all because, again, this is a demo that I built for this, but you can actually change the prompt, change the template, change the way you ask this question to make sure that eventually the answer that you want to get is the right one. So, for example, if I wanted this answer to include, you know, um, more code examples, then I can actually inject that into the prompt. And it will use that to actually find code examples from the documentation and share that. But you can actually see the difference between a model that is not familiar with Quark and basically says that Quark is a fictional platform to a model that now is aware of Quark and can actually share specific examples from the Quark documentation. Um, so going back to the presentation, and I see there are some questions. So, um, so, so one question is what are the good, some good ways to evaluate the performance of the embedding model? So, so that's a good question because embedding models eventually just create vectors, right? Uh, so let's say I have my data, I uh, vectorize the data based on the embedding model. Uh, now I have a vector space. So the way to actually check that, that test that is eventually what's the goal of a vector store. The main goal of a vector store is to store those vectors and allow you to query the vectors. So query for, let's say, the top five nearest vector to a specific one. And that's something that you can, of course, first of all, test using a human in the loop. So you can actually look at your vector space, ask some questions and see what are the top five, top, top 10 um, vectors that are related to one vector. So that's like one example. Uh, but in addition to that, um, there are, uh, are ways to visualize the vector space and see how your vectors actually group into different uh, um, vector spaces and basically see what's the center place, the center vector of this vector space and what are the vectors that are eventually grouped together. And uh, that actually allowed to visualize that, see how my vectors, how my, my, my actually not vector, my documents are uh, looking like in the vector space and then based on that, assess my embedding model. But eventually, to actually have a measurement a number, the only way to that is to A-B test, to have a full end-to-end -end life cycle, uh, change only one part of that architecture, and create metrics based on that. So eventually, as I said before, creating the right business metric or um, you know specific model metrics 
to check the entire and to an architecture allowing you to allow you to change few parts of it and see how it actually impact your uh, your performance um so another uh, uh, question that I got is have you seen uses of another LLM being used for evaluating performance of the LLM in question so first of all yes uh, this is actually nowadays becoming a really nice uh, um, architecture where you use a more complicated uh, um, LLM that usually will cost more and have higher latency, but is actually not relevant for use case, your use case because of its cost and latency, and you use that to evaluate your model. And, and that's something that I actually seen companies doing. Of course, the challenge with that is that it's a bit more difficult to get you know a number to get a specific metric that you can use to understand the impact of this model versus another but that's possible and i've seen cases of architecture where part of the human in the loop is not really human so basically i have this architecture um i have someone that look at the answers and as answer if this answer is actually good or not is the language is uh, relevant to my use case and if it answered my question then i can use part of those answers uh, uh, to be based on a model not a human in the loop so that's one architecture that's possible again there are some disadvantages to that of course as well <clears throat> um another question that we got is um that um, this architecture can have problems in identifying relationship between vector embeddings inside the vector DB, uh, if I'm not wrong. So, um, of course, identify relationship between uh, vector embeddings is, is again, is a challenge by itself. I talked about a bit before. Um, there are ways to measure that. For example, the way we implemented our vector store is with the ability to add metadata um to be part of the vector store and actually get back the, the string the data itself and some metadata create actual columns in the vector database to have more insights about the vectors um and based on that identify why it shows different vectors to be similar to each other but again eventually um actually getting metrics the way i see it is you need to make sure that the business get the impact and just based on that decide if an embedding model is good or not uh, which embedding to, model to use and by the way the vector db itself shouldn't be just a single vector space so what we've seen uh, companies doing uh, our customers doing is two things first um, using the vector db we've separate collections each one for different type of vectors uh, to make sure that they actually can query for the specific collection that they want to look at. And on top of that, divide each one of the collections to multiple tenants based on their customer's profiles. So when I query, I can actually filter based on a specific tenant and a specific collection. And on top of that, I can even filter on some of the metadata to actually make sure that my query to the vector store is as relevant as possible and not just a general purpose query on top of all of my data. <laughs> um, hope that it answered the question. And again, if there are other questions in this area, feel free to, to ask them. Um, another question is regarding uh, query, uh, query sanitization uh, between LLM and database. Basically, how do you make sure that your queries are, uh, um, are the right queries, you are not detected as part of your queries, um, how to make sure that your model, as I said before, by the way, your model actually answer what you expect it to answer, and people don't basically attack your model based on different prompts. So that's a problem with general purpose model for sure. Um, again, as I said before, there are ways to solve that um ways are based on tools that allow you to solve that same as tools to allow you to optimize by the way models and uh basically use code to to optimize that so one example that we've seen is um eventually running in quark as part of this architecture is a model that check for specific 
the context of the query. So, for example, things like um, is there uh, is there a racism in a query? Another example is should I reject this query based on specific language that it used? And, and based on that, decide if I want to move on with a specific query. Same could be for potential attacks. Is this query really relevant for my platform or just a general purpose query? Um, the idea to add this, this, this solution as part of your architecture is to make sure that you don't use those um, costly and, and, and um, API calls like for the embedding models and the LLM, unless you need to do that. Eventually, um, using commercial product, you pay by the query. So um, if you have those tools, those those models, or those even this logic that allow you to disqualify specific queries, it will allow you to both reduce the cost and make sure that the experience that your customers is getting is actually better. <clears throat> um, so I do want to summary, uh, summarize and then uh, check if there will be any other questions as well. Um, but as a quick summary of what we talked till now, um, so first, you need to ask yourself those questions. Do I need a general purpose solution or do I need my own specific solution? And as I said before, I think even the, the most crucial question is how can I measure my model, the outcome of this model. So those are questions actually connected to each other. Um, and I've seen many cases of customers of ours that started with thinking about a general purpose solution and a LAM solution, but eventually decided that for this specific task, actually using um, a language model can give them a better solution, not a LLM one, so a better solution, something that they can actually measure something that is really specific for their problem, but this is what they want to solve. Um, and they can just start with that. So those are questions that you need to ask yourself. Um, another is uh, um, if, if you want to use a commercial model, can I use it? What is its license? How do I connect it to my architecture? And maybe is it the right one? Should I A-B test between different commercial models? maybe even use another open source model as part of it. So again, this is another question that you should ask yourself and um, basically build your solution based off. And as I said before, and, and this is actually the key strategy as I said for 2024 is that you are not building models anymore. You are building solutions, you are building architecture that include different moving parts. Some of them are actual machine learning models some of them are, you know, uh, rule engines. Some of them are embedding models. Some of them can be based on traditional models and some based on a lens. And each one of those building blocks in your architecture can change the experience and can change the metrics that you get from a solution. So when you build a solution, think ahead about how you can change each one of the building blocks, how you can iterate on them, how you can connect that to your measurement and make sure that your architecture can actually scale, the architecture can actually be tested and you can actually measure how those different tests can actually uh, um, or eventually impact your metric. Um, so we are actually getting to the end of uh, the time for this specific conversation. Um, I do want to say that, first of all, if you want to learn more, not just about Quark, but even about this specific field, uh, let's chat about it. You can schedule a call with us. Uh, I would love to talk with you. I would like to better understand your use case and if and how we can help with that and even you know learn more technologies, more architecture and learn our companies building their solutions. So we'd love uh, to, to talk with you. We'd love to hear more about your use cases. And thank you everyone for joining this session um, with us. Thank you.